For a century, women marrying into the House of Windsor have shaped and transformed a dynasty. Now a new bride is about to join them. It's a huge transition for the royal family to accept someone like Meghan Markle into their ranks. Harry's marriage defines today's monarchy. It survived, adapted and in many ways thrived with modernity. This series tells the story of eight wives of Windsor, from the Queen Mother to Meghan Markle, evolving from aristocrat to commoner and now foreigner. In this film, we discover that it's in married life, once the fairy tale wedding is over, that the real work begins. There is no point in being a royal bride unless you're going to breed. That's what you're for. It's a life of public duty. Diana weaponized charity. It was kind of Florence Nightingale on acid. It's endless meat and greets, endless ribbon snipping. There are amazing perks and privileges. She was given a cascade of jewels. He deluged her with jewels. But some dangerous pitfalls. They've described her as vulgar, vulgar, vulgar. It's a life picked over by a merciless press. Not fair. From being a kind of saint, she became a sinner in the eyes of Fleet Street. So what can Meghan Markle learn from the wives who went before her? There are things that you're expected to do and things you can't do. And if you fail to understand that, then you're stuffed. Meghan Markle returns from her honeymoon, she'll be coming back to a very different life, one steeped in wealth and privilege. Well, the great thing about being a royal is you're first in the queue, you get the best seats in the house, the traffic lights, when they go red, you can go through them. If you have a dinner party, you can invite some of the finest brains and wittiest people in the world to sit at your table with you. And if you feel inclined and you want to help the planet, you can start a charity and people will come clamouring to give you money. It's a marvellous thing to be a royal wife of Windsor. The life of privilege is extraordinary. For one thing, you will never have money worries again in your life. And Meghan will never have to worry about where to live. Her new home will be at Kensington Palace, where Harry grew up with his family. If you marry a royal prince, you enjoy grace and favour residences, which at the moment is really very modest. The little cottage at Kensington Palace, no doubt a bigger cottage will come their way. Kensington Palace, the big benefit is that it's really right in the centre of London and you can very discreetly pop out to the shops. But perhaps one slight downside of Kensington Palace is there are a lot of other royals there, so you're all in there together. Well, when I had lunch with Princess Diana, I said to her, I said, strange this, isn't it? It's a bit like a prison here. She said, oh, no, 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 it's much more like an upmarket Coronation Street. As we go out, you'll see all the curtains twitching. Royal couples can also expect a country retreat, traditionally received as a wedding present from the Queen. Most have chosen an elegant period mansion, but in 1987, one couple booked the trend. Andrew and Fergie built themselves this very grand house um, called Sunning Hill. The irony of uh, the Duke and Duchess of York's place, Sunning Hill, was that it was the first example of royal building in the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. The press, quite rightly, said it looked like a Tesco, and they called it South York after the Dallas programme. And I think it was all downhill from there. The other great gift the Queen usually gives her sons and grandsons upon marriage is a title. Prince Harry is likely to receive a dukedom, so Meghan will become a duchess. But the most coveted title, and the one that will truly distinguish her as royal, is the right to be addressed as Her Royal Highness. The title Royal Highness defines the sovereign and the immediate heirs to the throne. So it is the badge of insiderdom. Two hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. Every royal wife has received the title HRH upon marriage, with one notable exception, the Duchess of Windsor, formerly Wallace Simpson. 
the woman for whom King Edward VIII abdicated the throne in 1936. The title HRH was denied her by the new king, George VI, and his wife, Queen Elizabeth. It was denied largely because Queen Elizabeth blamed Wallace Simpson for her husband's trauma that he suffered having to be king when he hadn't been prepared for it and when he wasn't well equipped to be king. Elizabeth carried out a long vendetta against the Windsors as a result of that, and the key element in that vendetta was depriving uh, Mrs. Simpson of the title HRH. The significance of not making Wallace HRH was that nobody would curtsy to Wallace if they came back to England. So actually this was a real snub, a real humiliation at a number of levels. And Edward always fought against it because he argued, I can't possibly bring my wonderful wife back to England to be humiliated if people aren't going to curtsy to her. So with one stroke, effectively, they were exiled as well. Besides palaces and titles, another great perk Meghan is likely to enjoy is the opportunity to wear some pretty impressive accessories. Royalty is all about rank, and a signal of rank is jewellery. I mean, the Queen has one of the greatest jewellery collections in the world. Her collection is overwhelming and enormous. The Duchess of Cornwall, for instance, has on permanent loan three tiaras. The Duchess of Cambridge has on loan the Lovers Not tiara. So I guess she will spread it out according to the pecking order. That tiara was on show again too. The crowd had got the glitter they came for. If you're going to be a princess, you really need to look like a princess. And a tiara, of course, is a fast track way to look like a princess. I think the tiara gives a princess clout. And if you wear these pieces that have got historic, symbolic importance to the royal family, then you're really associating yourself with the absolute core of monarchy. I think Meghan's got to wear a tiara at the wedding. No royal wife has been showered with more jewels than Wallace Simpson, the Duchess of Windsor. Between her marriage in 1937 and the Duke's death in 1972, Wallace acquired one of the most lavish private jewellery collections in the world. Wallace Simpson delighted in jewels. She loved jewels. She loved riffling them through her fingers. And she was given a cascade of jewels. He deluged her with jewels. It was all about giving her the status that they both knew she'd never have to make her appear the HRH that he couldn't give her. Wallace Simpson said, the one thing I'll never have is a tiara, because that is the significance of a royal princess and a queen, and she knew she wouldn't be that. As a new royal bride, Meghan can expect to enjoy a life of enormous privilege, but all this wealth and status needs to be earned and the price of being a princess is a lifetime of public duties. I don't envy the royal wives at all. It's endless meet and greets, endless banquets, endless ribbon snipping. Can I get a little bit to your right? Royal duties are far more bread and butter than the glamour of a red carpet. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much. A royal walkabout, you're meeting a bunch of strangers who've been standing around for hours in the hope of shaking your hands, and you talk to them about the weather. Princess Diana was thrust into the grinding reality of public engagements when she and Prince Charles went on a three-day tour of Wales in October 1981, shortly after they were married. Princess Diana's first experience of royal duties was awful. She was pregnant, she felt sick, um, she was suffering from bulimia nervosa, and she couldn't have been more miserable. Then the rains came, a Welsh speciality, of course, but pretty violent today. Despite their brollies, the couple got rather wet in Haverford West. She was sobbing in the car. Prince Charles said, you've got to keep going. She didn't want to be there, but she put a brave face on it. Being a royal wife of Windsor is a long game. 
You're in it for years if you want to succeed. And that means don't rush at things. Don't get overexcited at the first event because there will be events every day until the day you die. Then straight on to Thandilo for the fourth walkabout of the day, using a left hand for handshakes, looking much less than pristine, but still working. It's terrifying. While stamina may be one of the most important qualities a royal wife needs when carrying out public engagements, there's another vital rule she needs to observe. Know your place. One of the things to remember is you're a royal wife of Windsor. You have married in. You are not the principal party. This became a challenge for Charles and Diana because Diana was the star. <laughs> and they would go somewhere and the big crowds were the ones cheering for Diana. And on Charles's side, there were people meeting him but wanting really to meet Diana. That can actually irritate a man. I haven't yet worked out a method of splitting my wife in half. <laughs> Whilst Prince Charles in public made light of it, in private, he was very upset that his star had been eclipsed by his wife. I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives. <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. And I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. The duty of the royal wife, if she wants the relationship to survive, is to two paces behind and let the limelight focus on her husband. But while supporting her husband is one of the primary tasks of a royal wife, there's another important job that takes precedence. The traditional duty of the wife was to provide an heir and spare. You're a brood mare if you're a royal bride. As Meghan Markle embarks on life as a royal wife, one of her first big challenges will be carving out her working role. It's a position with no official job description. Meghan will need to forge her own path, learning from the example of her predecessors. If we go back a few hundred years, British women had only three possible roles. Childbirth, religion, and then there is this mixture of the caring, nurturing of childhood uh, and childbirth uh, with religion is what we call charity. And royal women are encouraged to be very active in these areas. The ones who do it best will choose their own areas and they will develop them. Meghan will be taking up charitable duties full time. But unlike most of her predecessors, she's already had a successful career. Meghan is giving up a lot of freedoms to become a royal wife. She's giving up this job that she's fought so hard for as an actress. She's not going to act anymore. There is, of course, an example of a royal wife of the previous generation who tried to keep up a professional life. That's Sophie, the Countess of Wessex, and that was a disaster. She was running a public relations company and she was lured into um, a sting. The Countess seemed relaxed as she arrived for her first public engagement in Britain since her indiscreet comments to a tabloid reporter disguised as an Arab sheikh. Today, she ignored the presence of another fake sheikh. An undercover newspaper reporter asked her about how much access she could get to the royal family, and she talked very unguardedly about the family. Huge embarrassment all round, and Sophie gave up her job. The trouble is that if they take part in some sort of business or commercial activity, their royalness gets in the way of that and, and, and they either exploit it themselves or they're exploited by others. You can't be a royal wife of Windsor and a PR girl. You simply can't. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. Besides giving up her acting career to take up royal duties, Meghan will also be giving up her political voice. Meghan's going to have to learn to be quiet about many things. She was articulate in her condemnation of uh, Donald Trump. She's supported gender equality around the world, and she's made that part of her cause. I don't just want to show up somewhere and wave my hand and feel like that's enough. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm going to have my name attached or I'm going to do it, I really get very hands-on. 
yes, she will have to curtail because invariably there is a political connotation and as a royal, they are apolitical, they are neutral, they cannot make political statements. My fear is that while she represents really positive change for the royal family, the royal family being the stifling institution it has been in the past, could shut down some of the things that are best about her. But with the restrictions that accompany royal life come a range of unique opportunities. If Meghan uses them wisely, she could maximise her role to really make an impact. Thank you so much and good evening. I'm truly privileged to be here. A royal wife doesn't have power, but she does have influence. People listen to what you say and you can use it for charity, you can use it for causes that are close to your heart. And whatever you say about an issue will be broadcast all over the world. And that means that you can really use your platform for the power of good. One royal wife who embraced the opportunities of her public role and shaped the path for future royal consorts was Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. During World War II, she rallied the nation and boosted morale. The royal visitors were wholeheartedly welcomed everywhere they went. The Queen Mother insisted on staying in London uh, and, and, and being visible uh, at Buckingham Palace during the war. She said wonderful things like, thank goodness we've been bombed at Buckingham Palace because it means I can look the East End in the face. So she played a, a really important role on the home front. She wouldn't be daunted, she wouldn't be encouraged to leave the country, and she even did some target practice on the rats in Buckingham Palace with her own gun. But in the 20th century, no royal wife did more to maximize the power of her role than Diana, Princess of Wales. By changing the style of royal engagements, and by championing unpopular causes, she would use the symbolism of royalty to change history. Princess Diana emerged as a very different kind of royal. She was not the white-gloved, hands-off royal of previous years. As far as Diana was concerned, the kiss, the cuddle, the hug was all part of what endeared her to the public. It's a cliché to talk about a breath of fresh air but she appeared to relate to people as human beings in a way that removed that stratification that is a real danger in monarchy. The Princess of Wales felt not the slightest apprehension about her visit to the Middlesex Hospital and its AIDS ward, according to press reports. Diana Princess of Wales exploded the do not touch myth as far as HIV is concerned. Prior to that, people thought if you touch somebody with AIDS or HIV, that you could catch it. I think Diana went through a lot of the struggles we're thinking about now with Meghan in wanting to be her own woman and have her own activism and do her own thing. And it was painful to watch the way in which she clashed with the royal family. She came out of this meeting one day, tearful, I said, what's up? She said, you just won't believe what's happened. The Queen asked me what I was doing and I said, I'm going to get involved in finding money for AIDS. And the Queen said, why do you want to get involved in that? Why, why, why don't you do something nice? Princess Diana weaponized charity, and she also personalized it and dramatized it. This fulfilled for her a deep need. It wasn't royal in the ordinary sense of the word. It was kind of Florence Nightingale on acid. It borrowed from Hollywood. And I don't think there's any accident that Meghan's behavior has something of this flavour. It has the slightly actressy quality. The danger is to think that royalty is about celebrity, and it isn't. And the secret of success as a member of the royal family is it's never about you, it's about the other people. But while Meghan will be keen to focus attention on her charitable work and humanitarian causes, as soon as she returns from honeymoon, the world's media will be eagerly waiting for her to fulfill the first duty of any royal wife. The expectation amongst Meghan's friends and family is that she will become pregnant very quickly after the wedding. She's 36, no time to wait. It's part of the conversation about, about who they are as a couple. Historically, it's always been the case that there is no point in being a royal bride unless you're going to breed. That's what you're for. You're a brood mare if you're a royal bride. And the expectation is great, 
The traditional duty of the wife was to provide an heir and spare. The key business of royalty is continuity, is survival. Rumours of a royal baby have been spreading for months. Mum-to-be Kate clearly had babies on her mind, while William received a baby grow, bearing the slogan, Daddy's little co-pilot. It's really very hard, I think, for a royal wife that everyone's always trying to work out whether you're pregnant or not and have you got a bump or not. It's hard for any woman, but I think the level of scrutiny makes it very painful. The pressure is often terrible. The whole history of England is changed by the difficulty of Henry VIII's wives in producing children. For those who conceive easily and give birth easily, fine. For those who don't, the pressure's a nightmare. Can we see the baby a bit more, please? How are you feeling? Sophie, I think all of her pregnancies have been problematic. Kate has suffered very severely from morning sickness that is totally debilitating. Diana's pregnancies were anything but plain sailing. During Diana's first pregnancy with uh, Prince William, such was the state of her mind and also her suspicion of Prince Charles that, you know, during one bitter row at Sandringham, she threw herself down the stairs and the prince just looked at her and just walked out. But with Diana, it got to a point where the Queen had to call in the editors of the uh, national newspapers and ask them to just back off and leave her alone, give her some space. As the clock ticks down to the royal birth, the public pressure gets even more intense. The level of excitement when a royal pregnancy is announced is incredibly high. It's almost hysterical. It's a boy! It's a boy! <laughs> it's so exciting. Just, we've been waiting all day for news. And, like, just, oh, it's amazing. I mean, if a royal birth could public now, people would be there. They'd be there trying to watch it. If it was on big screens in outside Hyde Park, they'd be trying to watch it. The press is absolutely agog. Uh, the hospital is surrounded. There are bulletins. There are newspaper reports. It becomes much more of a national occasion than just a domestic occasion. Before the birth of Prince George in 2013, the world's media maintained a round-the-clock vigil outside St Mary's Hospital, Paddington. It was dubbed the Great Kate Wait, and <laughs> it really did become that. We all were camped outside the Lindo Wing for weeks in advance, waiting for this blessed arrival. Prince William had been presented on these same steps by his mother, Diana, Princess of Wales. Today, 31 years on, there was a new prince, and again, the most eagerly awaited photograph in the world. Any other new mother, who's leaving the hospital with a baby for the first time. They're just expecting to get into a taxi or a car and go home, and no one's going to take their photo, apart from perhaps their husband outside the hospital doors. But it's different for Royal Bride. You're going to come out of the hospital with your baby, and everyone's going to take your photo. It's really intrusive, especially, you know, you have to scrub up and have your hair and makeup done and look happy, and the whole thing is just a ghastly ritual. With babies successfully ticked off the list, a royal wife can relax and enjoy the perks of the job. One of the biggest is dressing up. But even there, things can go wrong. She was wearing a shawl, a shawl that somewhat resembled a duvet. Her sense of dress leaves much to be desired. The job of a royal wife is to represent both queen and country, and the nation expects its princesses to look the part. Fashion is one of the most powerful tools for royal wives as they shape their public role, but fashion choices are also fraught with danger. The thing that all girlfriends of members of the royal family say to you is that the most intimidating thing is dropping a curtsy to the queen, and then secondly, deciding what to wear, because they will change their outfits three, four, five times a day. Because they're not allowed to say very much, their clothes have to speak for them. Everything is ascribed meaning. Their choices are all analysed. Can you get that over the shoulder, please? As Meghan Markle makes the transition from Hollywood actress to royal duchess, she may need to adapt her style to her new role. Meghan Markle is fascinating from a fashion perspective because unlike 
any royal woman before her almost, we have this huge back catalogue of pictures of her from her time as an actress. And she is very polished, but also quite casual as well. The flip-flop culture is part of just who I am. I love my cutoffs and flip-flops and being as relaxed as can be. So Meghan is going to have to evolve her style as a royal wife, and I'm not sure that she'll be able to get away with wearing a very short skirt in the way that she used to wear minis on the red carpet. When you marry into the royal family, you become you know, a brand ambassador for the royal family and for the UK. Now she has to think about what her dress is saying about her role and also about British fashion. <laughs> The monarchy represents stability in an ever-changing world, and historically, royal wives have used clothes to communicate this message. Most British royal women haven't been all that fashionable. Um, the, uh, they've tended to come up with a, a signature style. You think of Queen Mary. Queen Mary's fashions freeze somewhere at the beginning of the First World War. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, fixes herself somewhere in 1936, the coat dress. After the abdication crisis, there was a huge drive to make sure that the new regime would succeed. And as far as the Queen was concerned, this came out in a new presentation of her. Queen Elizabeth was presented as a fluffy, soft creature out of a sentimental Victorian painting. Her dresses were designed by Norman Hartnell to give this sweet, sentimental, romantic impression. She was going to be the opposite of Wallace Simpson. Wallace Simpson is a fashion icon, and that was regarded on the whole as a bad thing. And she's Art Deco woman. She is ultra fashionable. That hard edge, the lacquered hair, the ironing board chest, these aggressive and um, eccentric shapes. I mean, she's magnificent at it. She once said that I might not be a beautiful woman, but I can dress better than everyone else. And she definitely lived up to that. It would be four decades before another royal fashion icon emerged. Over the course of her 16 years in the public eye, Diana, Princess of Wales, would harness the power of fashion to become a global celebrity. But at the start of her career as a royal wife, mastering the art of royal dressing was a learning curve. I don't think the transition from Sloan Ranger to sophisticated fashion icon was altogether smooth. And there was one occasion before she married the Prince of Wales and she went with him to um, an event at Goldsmiths Hall, and she was wearing a very low-cut black dress that had nothing to hold it up. It was in black taffeta, it was off the shoulder, and by normal royal standards, it was fairly revealing. She showed an awful lot of cleavage, and it led to hysteria in the media. Even the main TV news led with you know, discussion of whether she showed off her, her nipples or not. And as she approached our camera on the first floor, the worst moment seemed to be negotiating the stairs with her long skirt. She realised that she'd made a bit of a fashion blunder. She was just absolutely new to the whole thing. Um, but she learnt very quickly, and she never had that sort of problem again. Over the next decade, Diana would emerge as a global fashion icon using the power of clothes to draw attention to her causes and dominate news headlines. One designer was instrumental in shaping Diana's wardrobe, the late Catherine Walker. Today, her Chelsea studio is run by her husband and co-designer, Saeed Cyrus. Wherever the princess went, they wanted to see her as a British princess. So our research looked at what we thought would make the clothes look uniquely British. Uh, research went back as far as Elizabethan times, but concentrated more on a period 100 years ago of Queen Mary and Queen Alexandra, which we felt were the roots of modern British royal dressing. We took these images and brought them into the, the modern era. One of the most iconic dresses Catherine Walker designed for Diana was dubbed the Elvis dress made for the princess's 1989 visit to Hong Kong. 
We decided to go with pearls because we felt they represented the mystery of the Orient. And I believe there were 20,000 of them. If you look at the image of that outfit now, and you compare that with Queen Alexandra and Queen Mary, you can't help but notice the visual symmetry between the images from 100 years ago and this modern, polished princess. But while Diana had a natural grasp of the power of fashion, for other royal wives, mastering the art of royal dressing has been somewhat more of a challenge. They'd sent a Nimitz baseball cap for the Duchess, which she cheerfully wore for most of the day. She'd chosen the rest of her new outfit because it looked sort of naval. Fergie sadly may not go down in the same way as Diana as a fashion icon. Fergie did not have the same good taste in clothes. She wore much more flamboyant sort of clothes. One of the Queen's private secretaries described her as vulgar, vulgar, vulgar. It's unkind, but I think a lot of people felt that her choice of clothes reflected that. There were not one, but two fashion shows that evening, and the Duchess responded to the double event with her best and most complicated dress of the visit. The little girl with the bouquet was deeply and understandably overawed. A lot with Sarah was self-inflicted. I mean, for example, uh, she went out on one royal engagement with the Duke of York, and she was wearing a shawl, a shawl that sort of somewhat resembled a duvet. And she got ridiculed for it because her sense of dress leaves much to be desired. I mean, she was a lovely girl, but her judgment just wasn't, wasn't as acute as Diana's. The recent generation of royal wives seem to have learnt lessons from their predecessors' fashion triumphs and disasters. The Duchess of Cambridge has returned to Catherine Walker for much of her working wardrobe. The Duchess of Cambridge has found her own way of doing modern royal style. It's a very polished, very elegant, very ladylike way of dressing. Kate's style is always one of decorum. She never looks inappropriate. So whether or not she's pregnant or she's just had a baby, she looks elegant, she looks refined. As soon as Kate stepped onto the global stage, the Kate effect became this fashion phenomenon. I think um, it was predicted that she would add a billion pounds to the UK fashion economy within you know, a year or so of, of becoming a member of the royal family. Those dresses that she wore in the early days, dresses by Reese, which would immediately sell out, um, and then the Issa blue dress. Again, you couldn't get that dress for love nor money. So that Kate effect was incredible. And we're also seeing it with Meghan. This handbag, sent as a canny gift by a small Scottish label, sold out in a flash when the bride-to-be clutched it on an official engagement in Nottingham. And then there's those very fashionable, quite sexy, high heels by Aquazura. And the last time I looked, you couldn't buy them anywhere. But one thing the royals can't buy is goodwill. And when a fairy tale marriage begins to teeter, being a royal wife can be a lonely place. The royal family do tend to close ranks, and it can be very difficult for the royal wife after divorce, because really, to a large degree, she's on her own. Of all the challenges facing royal wives, one of the most difficult is managing the press. As Meghan Markle embarks on royal life, she'll need to draw on all her skills and judgment as she navigates the perils of the British media. Meghan Markle is a girl who until very recently, would be on the phone to journalists trying to, you know, get her picture in the paper. You guys, thank you so much. So she was a hustler trying to improve her standing on the celebrity ladder. Now she's had to pull that ladder up and stand behind the royal drawbridge. So the people that she once thought were friends are now enemies. Meghan is already facing her first tests because of the press. They've got hugely excited about her, so excited. 
But already people are writing in the newspapers, actually, is she being too enthusiastic? Is she hugging people too much? Is she actually too good at it? And she's got to realize you cannot win as a royal wife of Windsor. Nobody has found that out more than poor Sarah Ferguson, who was adored at first. It was a huge royal wedding, amazing coverage, but quickly it began to go wrong. And her energy and her enthusiasm, well, they were squashed. I'm not entirely sure what actually went wrong with Fergie, but the press turned against Fergie. She made one or two mistakes. She behaved in an unduchess like way. All these men around here. Love you. I'll see you later. <laughs> she clowned around. I don't think she took her role quite seriously enough, perhaps. Um, I don't think she recognized that as a duchess, she was representing Britain and that a certain decorum was required. Let's face it, she made some mistakes. You may hope there are no paparazzi, but you've got to remember that somewhere on a hill in the distance will be someone with an amazing telephoto lens. And then, of course, she was famously um, photographed with her financial advisor. I mean, she was wearing a bikini in some garden in the south of France, and he appeared to be sucking her toes. OK, you don't expect somebody to crawl through the bushes to take photographs of you uh, sunbathing topless while you're with your financial advisors who's sucking your toes. Uh, you don't expect that. But by the same token, you don't go away with somebody who's not your husband and sunbathe topless. She was at Balmoral when those photographs came out. The family came down to breakfast and there was Fergie in this shocking scene. And that was the end. While Fergie went from popular duchess to pariah in the eyes of the press, another royal wife has made the reverse journey. I would say that Camilla has actually been to hell and back. She was vilified for years, and some people still can't say her name without spitting it out. I think in the early days, she simply hid in her bunker and waited for the flack to stop. And eventually, it did. Throughout that period of vilification, she never once tried to defend herself. She never responded, no matter what the provocation. And I think that actually is how she managed this extraordinary transition from total vilification to Duchess. While Camilla ignored press attention, Diana courted it and publishers used her image to sell millions of newspapers around the world. The press and the media and Diana was extraordinary. I can't recall a, a single day in the seven or eight years that I was there where there wasn't a picture or a story about Diana. The monarchy's relationship with the press transformed in the 20th century. The monarchy is treated as essentially sacred, right through to the 1970s, and then things begin to break up. The late 80s, early 90s were a period, I would say, where the press really lost its moral compass. Day after day, there were shocking revelations. There were the tapes. First of all, there was the tape that was called Squidgy Gate, in which Diana had been having a late night telephone conversation with a boyfriend. He had called her his pet name for her, which was Squidgy, and there'd been darlings and, God, I hate this family. A very, very embarrassing conversation. And all of this, the press absolutely lapped up, and the public lapped it up. The press will never be satisfied. It will build you up and it will knock you down. And I think Diana never really realized that. She thought she could play the press, and she was very good at doing it in some respects. But the problem is that, you know, she had secrets to hide and the press found them out. So from being a kind of saint, she became a sinner in the eyes of Fleet Street. The answer is you don't go out and openly court the media because you're asking for trouble. You're opening the front door, you're letting them in. And once you let them in, impossible to let them out again. The calls mounted today for curbs on the paparazzi who plagued the princesses every move with appeals to the world's press barons to stop paying photographers who intrude. 
certainly after Diana relinquished her bodyguard, the intrusion into her life was, quite frankly, obscene. She would say, why don't you go rape somebody else? Because she'd be surrounded by photographers saying, put your head up and, you know, smile, and calling her all kinds of names. That was really appalling behaviour. As Earl Spencer said at her funeral, she was hunted more than any human being. In recent years, the royal family's attitude to the press has changed. William started the trend of saying, enough is enough, you've overstepped the mark and you don't do that. And he has consulted lawyers on several occasions when Kate was being harassed, when Kate was photographed topless, and Harry has done the same thing. When it first became known that he was going out with Meghan and the press started camping on her doorstep, he called a halt as well and told the media to back off. Despite these stricter boundaries between the press and the royal family, Meghan Markle will need a thick skin as she embarks on royal life. If anyone is going to survive it, Meghan will. Because of her background, because of her, her career, she has been an actress. She has courted the cameras. She's pretty savvy in a way that her predecessors were not. But sometimes the pressures of the media become too great. Despite the hopes of the nation and the best intentions of individuals, the fairy tale turns sour. It's then that royal wives face perhaps the biggest test of all, divorce. Fergie's divorce settlement is thought to be worth about three million pounds. Now she claims that the divorce deal was not that great, but the fact of the matter is she lived beyond her means. She splashed the cash. Diana got a fantastic divorce deal. On the downside, she had to give up her royal title and she had to give back some royal jewelry. But on the positive side, the settlement was worth about 17 million pounds. As one of Charles's financial advisors put it, she took him to the cleaners. But even if a royal wife manages to get a good divorce deal and bank some cash, history tells us that it's difficult to make a clean break. If a royal wife says, I've had enough, I want to leave the marriage, the royal family do tend to close ranks and it can be very difficult for the royal wife after divorce. Once you've joined the royal family, it's like joining the mafia, you can never really leave it. And as Fergie and Diana found when they divorced, they were still very much in the limelight. The careers of Diana and Fergie after the divorce were really seriously tragic for both women. They're on their own. They don't have the support. They don't know quite how to cope with their isolated lives. Any comments on your financial problems? Will you pay the bills? They become the victims of all sorts of people who are going to take advantage of them. They've been inside, they've been part of the setup, and all of a sudden they're cut adrift. And actually, the royals wish, really, to eradicate them from, from history, and they're pretty good at doing that. So if Diana and Fergie broke the rules, What's the secret of being a successful royal wife? And what advice can Meghan Markle take as she gets to grips with the job? The only really sensible piece of advice that you can give a woman marrying into the royal family is make your marriage work. A successful royal wife obviously looks amazing in photographs. You're unbelievably patient because your job is going to be about meeting people you're never going to see again and pretending to show an interest. You've got to understand that there are things you can do and things you can't do, things that you're expected to do and things you're expected not to do. And if you fail to understand that, then you're stuffed. To be a successful royal wife of Windsor, remember what you're getting into, something that's been going on for a thousand years. You're just one person in this story. So as Meghan Markle prepares to marry her prince, how might she make her mark as a royal wife of Windsor? The things that I love about Meghan Markle are that she is a talented woman. She has built her career from scratch. She's a breath of fresh air. 
She's very intelligent, she's very exciting, and that's where I think she'll be a force for good. She's beautiful, she's successful. She is a serious, proper person, you know, with ambitions of her own to make a difference on the world stage. Megan is an absolute natural performer. Part of me thinks maybe she regards this as the greatest acting part she's ever gonna have, that of British princess. And who would turn that down?